I'm Bridget and Delicato from Mindful Gardening and the Innisfil Seed Library, and welcome to Growing More Succession Planting. This webinar is part of a series called Get Out and Grow, and it's in partnership with the Rosardo Health and Wellness Center. You'll find registration info for the rest of the series on my website, mindfulgardening.ca, or on the Rosardo Center's website as well. And tonight we'll be looking at what you can plant now and into the end of summer for a hall harvest, hall harvest, especially easy and quick seeds um, that you can direct sow into your garden. And we'll also be covering how to plant garlic this fall for harvest next year, one of my favorite things to do. A reminder that we are recording tonight's webinar, so you may want to keep your cameras off uh, and keep yourself muted until uh, our question period at the end. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation, uh, either about the presentation or vegetable gardening in general, uh, or any other gardening questions you might have. And you can just simply type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, and when we do the uh, question period, you can feel free to have your voice uh, on this call as well, which is always nice. So first off, we want to consider a few things when we're succession planting. So replacing and rotating crops. So succession planting is essentially planting more throughout the season or replacing an entire crop with something new um, that's finished. For example, your peas are, are probably done now that the heat of summer is on. So you might wanna plant something where your peas were or your early lettuce has started to bolt. So you've noticed the center of your lettuce has started to rise up to the sky, started to flower and is no longer edible, but it's making seeds. So you know, if you want to save lettuce seeds, that's how you do it. But really those um, crops are, they like the cool weather, so they're, they're dying back. So you might want to replace um, where you planted those things. And you can also um, consider rotating your crops. So if you planted one thing there, don't plant the same thing there again, because sometimes you can transfer uh, soil borne diseases um, to that same plant family. So you might want to switch up what you're planting uh, in that spot. And you might also want to consider um, direct sowing your seeds, so putting those seeds right into the soil and letting nature take its course uh, versus transplants, which you may do earlier in the season uh, with your indoor grow lights, or if you're lucky enough to have a greenhouse, that's something that you might want to consider. You can direct sow a lot um, for succession planting later in the season. And I really recommend that that's your priority when you think about succession planting, because there's so many things you can grow and it's easy. Um, for example, beans, carrots, beets, radish, and spinach a little later when it cools down a little more in the season. Um, if you do have that desire to grow indoors, you have the space to continue having your grow lights going, or as I mentioned, you've got that greenhouse, uh, you can grow transplants uh, for your succession crops. Uh, for example, you can jumpstart your lettuce or your basil um, and brassicas, so things like cabbage and broccoli, they like to, to be transplanted. They do take a little longer to develop uh, into a mature head. Um, so that's something you might want to consider um, growing and as a transplant. Uh, but it really is too late for your long maturing plants. So your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, essentially those are grown uh, beginning of the season. So you're looking at six to eight weeks before that uh, last frost. And then they're in your garden all season long maturing because we do have a relatively short season. So you're not uh, succession planting those long maturing plants, mostly from the nightshade family. So those you know, tomatoes and, and peppers and eggplant that need that long season to ripen and produce for you. If you were to grow them now, you just wouldn't have enough time to uh, have some tasty uh, fruit from them. And then you also want to consider the days until frost. So that first frost, it is around the corner, even though we're in the lovely summer days of July. So I'll be covering what and when you can plant up to that first uh, expected frost in our region. And you also, when you're succession planting, want to think about benefiting the soil between your plantings. So when you're replacing an entire crop, you imagine all those nutrients have been uh, taken up by your plants that were there and gave you some tasty beans or, or peas or lettuce, as I'd mentioned. So you probably want to add some compost uh, and or manure to that soil and just gently fork it in. And you're just giving that soil a replenishment um, for your next, your next planting. And uh, another good tip is um, if you are growing peas or beans, leave that little root system. So just cut the plant down, 
but those roots are actually providing nitrogen to your soil. So you can leave those in and just plant around them and you've got that little nature's boost of nitrogen in your soil. I also leave um, those roots over winter so that that nitrogen boost is just doing its magic over the winter and spring. So there's just sort of some general things to consider when you're thinking about planting more. So now we're looking at what and when to grow. So as I'd mentioned, we have a relatively short growing season. So it's really key to plan what can be grown in succession uh, and when to plant them to give you the most time to get the most harvest essentially before that first frost hits. And some plants um, like carrots and beets and radish, they're okay even with that little uh, first touch of frost and spinach actually can be a lot sweeter with that little bit of frost, kale as well. Um, so, but, you know, for some things you wanna think about when I'm, how am I gonna get the most harvest out of things before winter rears its head? So that first frost, I know we don't wanna think about it right now, but you know, it is something to consider. Um, so in our planting zone here in Innisfil and Barrie, we're looking at planting zone 5A. Uh, so our first frost is typically between October 1st and the 10th. So we might get a light frost or even potentially a hard frost at that time. And something to think about is some seeds can be planted every two to three weeks from spring to late summer. So that's something that you can sort of think about prior to that, you know, frost date coming is that you can plant, you know, two to three weeks. And I'll be explaining what you can do uh, um, basically from spring to midsummer every two to three weeks. And tonight, uh, for tonight's purposes, we'll be talking about um, planning your succession planting for now. So we're basically at the end of July, so mid to end of July and then August 1st and September 1st. So that gives us sort of a, a timeline leading up to that uh, frost date. So what can you grow every two to three weeks? So really from spring to late summer. Root vegetables tend to do very well. So you can start your beets, carrots, and radish um, and grow those every couple of weeks uh, throughout the, the, the summer. And herbs do well as well. You can direct so basil, cilantro, dill, uh, legumes like bush bean. Uh, pole beans take a little longer. Typically you, you'll grow your pole beans uh, at the, you know, when the summer is, the soil is warmed up and summer has just begun. And then that plant will sort of take its, its time through the whole season. They do mature longer, but bush beans, you can keep growing them in succession, have beans all summer long. And uh, your leafy veg, uh, your lettuce, kale, and mustard greens, those are things that grow quite quick. Um, and you can grow those throughout throughout the summer every two to three weeks. And kale could be grown just for its sort of what we call its baby leaves. So you don't have to have that full mature plant and just sort of snip what you need uh, as the baby, tender baby uh, kale that's really great in salads. Um, and some vegetables prefer cooler weather like radish and lettuce. Um, so you, something you might wanna think about if you are growing them now is to plant them in the shade of other plants because they may uh, bolt or you know not really like the heat of summer. So for example, you could plant your radishes and lettuce between tomato plants. So you've got the shade of that plant um, so they're not getting that direct sunlight on them. So here we are mid to late July. It's hard to believe, but this is where we are today. And you have to consider this is also the hottest part of summer really. Um, so try to resist growing the more cool season um, vegetables like, like spinach until later in the season. They'll just do better and uh, they'll, they'll appreciate that cooler weather. Um, but there are things you can grow. Um, surprisingly enough, you can grow summer squash uh, in succession. So your zucchinis and your cucumbers, this is really your last chance, so I'd say in the next week or so, to direct sow those seeds into the soil. Um, you know, give them a lot of space because they do like to, to climb or sprawl. And if you're growing your leafy veg like lettuce, you'll want to look for bolt resistant varieties. So as I mentioned, bolting is when that stalk of that lettuce comes up and seeds are produced. So if you can find varieties that resist um, that bolting, you'll get more produce during the summer months. And Asian greens tend to um, withstand the heat a little better. So, if, you know, there's lots of different uh, interesting leafy greens um, and even mustards in the Asian uh, sort of varieties that that do appreciate the heat and will do well. And of course, bush beans, again, you can grow those uh, now as well. And again, every two to three weeks, if you like, if you really like your beans. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, pole beans, it's a little late for those guys, but root vegetables, herbs, 
um, you know, basil, cilantro, dill. And of course, don't forget flowers. Flowers are such a beautiful addition to our gardens, um, not just aesthetically, but they bring the pollinators um, and they just add so much um, more character to your garden. So at this point, you're looking at, if you wanna grow sunflowers, you're looking at dwarf sunflowers. So in much smaller varieties, because those those big guys, are, they're actually coming into maturity now. You might be seeing uh, advertisements for um, sunflower tours in the in the big farm fields. So those are, you know, already have done their, their magic. But if you want to grow them, uh, find the dwarf varieties. Cosmo, such a pretty um, sort of cottage favorite. So get those in your garden. Calendula, which is also edible. Nasturtium, which is also edible. Uh, amaranth, edible as well. <laughs> so those three are beautiful uh, additions to the garden and they do like the warm soil to grow in. And of course, zinnias, you can't forget those gorgeous, uh, again, cottage favorites. And nigella, it's just a tiny little delicate flower, but um, such a beautiful addition um, to a the veggie garden. So again, we're looking at two and a half months before that first frost date. So if you're eager to grow things right now, this is the list to, to refer to. So you're asked, someone's asked what uh, variety of lettuce does not bolt. Um, I don't know any offhand, but the package will tell you. It'll actually tell you slow to bolt. Um, that's usually what you want to look for. Um, so there's probably different varieties that have been um, sort of created to, to resist that bolting. So always check your, your uh, lettuce seed packages for that. So as we're moving into August, um, so which isn't too far off, so we're looking at about a couple of months before that first frost. So again, we're working into late summer and inevitably towards the fall. Uh, so you're looking to plant your more cool uh, season vegetables. So this is when that spinach gets to be put into that ground. So direct sowing that spinach and your lettuces. Um, again, you can still plant the bolt resistant, but any varieties that you really enjoyed earlier in the summer, get those back in the ground and they'll come up for you. And if you are looking to grow uh, roots, again, your uh, carrot, beet, radish, they all like the cooler weather. And you can actually taste sort of more of a sweetness as they move into the, those cooler months. So they will appreciate as we move into those uh, cooler days. Now, when you're growing your legumes, it is a little late for, um, for beans, although you could still probably get away with, with some bush bean varieties, some that, that grow a little quicker. But if you're growing snow peas, as you may have in the uh, spring, look for dwarf varieties. So rather than the ones that climb up your trellis, look for sort of bush varieties, dwarf varieties. They tend to have um, a shorter growing season. And again, moving into that cooler season, they're going to like that, um, that weather better. And you'll get peas uh, in the fall. And for basil, it's your last chance. Basil loves the warmth. Um, you'll actually burn leaves as, as frost starts to come. It, doesn't even take a frost sometimes for, for uh, basil to turn brown and, and uh, look a little sad. So it's your last chance uh, if you'd like to have basil towards the end of the summer, get them in August 1st. Cilantro and dill are actually quite um, uh, happy to grow in cooler weather, as you'll see even later they can be grown. And again, there's so many leafy things. Think Just think leafy as you work, go into the, uh, into, the, into the fall. So you've got your leaf lettuce, your Swiss chard. Again, when I talk about the kale being baby kale, at this point, it you know, in early August, by the time it grows, it, you won't get that big plant with, you know, the tall stalk and lots of leaves, but you'll get lots of um, baby leaves, uh, which is wonderful in salads. And all those mustard greens as well. And broccoli and cabbage are another couple of things uh, you can grow. And one tip for those, they do um, take a little longer to grow. So if you're interested in um, growing those into the fall, you could start those now as um, indoor plants or in your greenhouse as transplants. So you can transplant those out uh, in early August or mid-August to get a little more uh, of, a, of a large, um, you know, pro produce uh, as opposed to just its leafy greens that, that come up. So again, lots to grow in just a couple months before that first frost. And you can still be planting in September. You don't have to put your feet up just yet. So you're looking at about a month before that first frost, a month and a, and a week or so. Again, radish is um, something that, you know, appreciates the, the cooler weather. They're quick to grow. Um, so really get, get those guys in. It's a little late for um, some other um, of the roots. But again, if you 
you might be able to get away with some row cover if you're really keen to to get those guys in the ground but really um the best tip is to get get those quick radishes in there and all those leafy greens your spinach your lettuce your swiss chard baby kale mustard greens and then some of those really wonderful um uh, sort of brassicas like your bok or pak choy arugula grows so quickly and loves the cool weather and your mescaline mist mix is another really good one and again believe it or not cilantro and dill will still grow quite well for you um, at this time of year cilantro you may notice when you grow it uh, earlier in the season does bolt very quickly as soon as the heat comes so you'll get a much uh, slower uh, more more to enjoy um, as it gets cooler because it won't bolt as quickly uh, so yeah so that's really what you can be growing um, right through in, until uh, September so get those seed packets out kind of figure out you know, what do I have? What, what would I like to continue to grow? If you have the time and the space to do the transplants, you know, you can get ahead a little, even with lettuce, you can start your lettuce uh, indoors just to get those, you know, going a little sooner. But again, direct sow is easy and there's lots of options. So that's what I recommend. So as we move into the fall, um, planting garlic, it is honestly one of my greatest joys. Um, it's sort of the longest um, you know, time to, to get a result, but it's so rewarding um, to, to be able to grow your, your garlic at home. Um, typically, you're planting them between October 1st and the 15th of November. That's sort of your, you know, borderline. If you're running late, uh, fear not, there's still time. I typically start mine uh, Thanksgiving weekend, so around, you know, 12th to 15th of, of October is usually when I'm out there with my, with my cloves. Um, so there is you know, some work ahead uh, of, of planting at a harvest. And there's about nine months where you're not really doing much. It's just nature is taking its course. Those bulbs are growing underground. Aside from snipping scapes, which you may have heard of or you may have done, um, which allows the energy to go from what would become sort of a flower into that bulb to create those bulbs. So that's something that you do just a few weeks before harvest, which I'm doing right now. So the harvesting is happening right now. The scapes have long gone and eaten very tasty um so that that is something to think about i have a question what variety i prefer um i look i love good old-fashioned music um that's a really popular one um it's sort of you know not too hot not too spicy it's just a nice um sort of gentle flavor i've discovered georgian fire which is a really nice spicy one um so if you can get your hands on that it's it's a pretty good one uh siberian if you really like the spice, that's a, that's a really good variety. Um, so yeah, so you know, sort of see what your what your palate is. Try new things. It's always kind of fun to experiment if you come across uh, some some bulbs that uh, that you can try growing. Um, so yeah, the key to successfully growing your garlic is to find a sunny location uh, in your yard. Think about sunny, you know, all summer long, more so than uh, as things change as as we come to fall. So think about where you're getting that most sun uh, through the season into July and August. Then you'll want to amend that soil. Again, just like when you're rotating crops, you want to add compost and manure. You want that rich, beautiful soil for those cloves to make the best bulbs for you. So, you know, avoid rocky um, soils. You've got big rocks in there. That's going to affect the, the creation of that bulb. Um, if it's too sandy, you'll just lose water. So you just want a really rich, um, base for those plants and that's something that you know once your plants have come out that, that are currently there amend that soil and just make that soil all that, all that much richer um, and then you'll want to plant good quality bulbs and i prefer local organic garlic and there are a lot of local suppliers there's um you know uh, a farm in cookstown for example that sells organic um seed garlic as they call it seed garlic is you know you can plant what your own that you've harvested. Um, seed garlic just tends to be the biggest bulbs that grow because the bigger the clove, the bigger the bulb. Um, and there are uh, other, other companies out there. If you just sort of look in the outskirts of, of our area, you'll find um, garlic. And you'll also find them at farmer's markets. So start going to the farmer's markets. Um, they'll probably be selling them for eating, but just find the biggest bulbs you can. And those cloves will be wonderful to grow. And you'll know that it'll grow well here because it's local. That's the other thing. And you know it hasn't been treated um, when it's organic, which is also wonderful. 
Um, and the trick too is to allow those roots to form before the ground freezes. So that's why you want to get them in before November 15th, um, because you want that root development to start before the ground freezes. Oh, the Cookstown provider, I believe they're called organic garlic, something like that. They do have a Facebook page. Uh, if you if you're on Facebook and you look look that up, Cookstown Organic Garlic, uh, you will find them. They are um, probably starting now, starting to sell because right now we are harvesting it. So they're, they'll be selling it now or soon anyway. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they just called organic garlic. <laughs> so how to plant it? Again, buy it locally if you can, or an organic, or get your, so if you did grow garlic, choose your biggest, best. I know it's hard to do. You want to eat it because it's beautiful, but the bigger the clove, the healthier that clove, uh, the bigger your bulb will be next year. So it's hard to sacrifice, but try to do it. Try to pick your best, biggest um, garlic uh, bulbs with the biggest cloves, and that's, that's going to give you the most success. You'll want to separate those cloves carefully. You don't want to damage that papery covering because that's going to protect it over the winter into its development. If you accidentally, as you're separating um, that hard neck garlic, and hard neck um, grows better in our climate than soft neck, you might know the two. Um, music is an example of a hard neck. So you've got that nice hard center, give that a wiggle first and carefully um, take those cloves apart. If you do expose a clove, you're, you're having that for dinner tonight or uh, sometime that week. It's just not going to survive uh, underground. It'll, it'll rot and, and just be a big mushy mess and won't grow for you. So make sure those papery coverings are intact. And much like uh, tulips and other bulbs, you want to plant the tip up because the root system will develop underneath uh, the bottom of that bulb. If you imagine that bulb underground with its tip up, that's the direction you want to grow them in. And typically you're growing them um, four inches deep and six inches apart. That gives them lots of room to grow and lots of room when you're harvesting to stick your, your uh, fork or your spade in and not damage the bulbs next door. So that gives them lots of birth uh, around them to, uh, to harvest. So that's something to think about as well. And then I like to cover my garlic with a nice thick layer of straw. And the good thing about uh, moving into fall with all those fall decorations, um, a lot of the garden centers and um, Farms even will start selling uh, big bales of straw. So get your hands on one. You can share it. There's quite a, quite a lot there. Unless you grow lots of garlic, then you, you know, you've got lots of straw to spare. But I do a nice, good, thick layer. You're looking at maybe six inches of straw. And what that does is it protects that and insulates um, that area where your garlic's growing all winter long. And then in the spring, when things thaw out, it keeps that, that soil moist. It keeps the temperature consistent all through the summer. So even through the heat of summer, you're not drying out that patch. It's keeping consistent. I don't water my garlic. I just rely on the rain. And again, that straw insulates and keeps it moist and suppresses weeds, of course. Um, you try to get straw that's not seeded, which can be hard. But if you do see little sprouts coming up, try to pick those out so that uh, your garlic's not competing with the weeds or those little sprouts. So that's really sort of the, the sort of main things you want to look at when you're planting garlic. If you want to learn more, I do have a garlic video series on my YouTube channel, um, Mindful Gardening. So it's from planting them to harvesting to drying them. So you can watch the whole series and see uh, how it's done. And you can access those on the uh, mindfulgardening.ca website or go to YouTube and look up Mindful Gardening. You'll find it there. So it's, it's a lot of fun and like I said, very rewarding. So just some tips as we move along here. So again, if you're growing lettuce in midsummer, get those bolt resistant varieties. Look on the package, it'll tell you that it's bolt resistant. Or Google it, kind of see what suppliers out there um, sell bolt, um, bolt resistant varieties. Pick your favorites. If you are succession planting cucumbers or peas, look for early to mature ones. So with you know less, less than 50 days or 55 days if you can for your cucumbers and if you're doing peas again that more of a bush variety so a dwarf variety as opposed to the, the climbers and if you're um, removing an entire spent crop and replacing uh, with new seeds or plants you want to gently fork in compost and manure just to really replenish that soil and if you're growing in containers don't just um, plant again in the soil that was in there in containers 
if you think about it, they are just giving and giving. And there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere else to get your nutrients. So that plant, whatever was in there, especially if you had a tomato plant, for example, in a pot, it has just depleted that soil completely. So when you put something else in there, you're probably not going to get the best results. So really, it is best to replace that potting soil with some fresh potting soil. So get your, your bag out that you, that you used half of and uh, fill up, fill that up. What you can do with your spent um, potting soil is save it for next year and you can amend it. You can add your manure and compost and, you know, pot other things. Maybe not your vegetables, but I, I tend to do that with my flowers, for example, um, um, that I purchase. So I'll have potted flowers in, in the spent uh, potting mix with some added nutrients to it. But really, you want it to, to give your vegetables, especially the most nutrients that they can get. Again, with our short season, you want, you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. More tips is to really interplant to maximize space. So instead of always thinking of completely, you know, having a blank slate to work from when you've removed a crop, think about any little spaces you have between your plants. So, for example, you can plant your heat intolerant plants like your radish and lettuce between plants. So right now our tomato plants are nice and big. So plant them sort of in the shadow and the shade of those and you'll get some good success. And of course, your herbs and flowers, like if you're plant direct sowing, those flowers I had mentioned, like the cosmos and the zinnias, just sprinkle them in between things and they'll just come up alongside stuff. Things don't have to always be in neat little rows. You can kind of see where the blank spots are now and uh, fill them up. And of course, herbs, just anywhere you can find a little spot with some sun. Uh, they always appreciate the sun. Um, get them in there between your plants. And again, if you're starting, uh, if you're okay to start things indoors, if that's just something you enjoy doing, uh, or you're lucky enough to have a greenhouse, you know, kickstart some of that production. So get your cabbage, your broccoli, your kale, uh, your basil, and even lettuce. You know, it does really well direct sown, but if you want to uh, um, get a little kickstart, especially if it's head lettuce, that does take longer than the, the more of the leaf lettuce, um, you know, get those, get those in if that's what you want to do. But again, I always advise uh, going for the, uh, the direct sow. It's just a, a little easier and less stressful. And if you're planting um, your summer squash later in the season, again, it, it is possible if you're sort of on the cusp right now. So in the next week or so, you, you want to get those in. Try to find disease resistant uh, varieties. And again, it'll tell you that on the package, um, especially for problems like powdery mildew, they tend, those tend to sort of rear their head a little more in the hotter uh, seasons. So as, this, as the summer is, is rolling along, you're more likely to get those from neighboring gardens or farms. Um, unfortunately, it, it is airborne and, and can travel. So if you can find varieties that are resistant to that, you'll be ahead. You may still be battling uh, cucumber beetles and all those fun uh, insects, but at least you won't uh, be devastated by powdery mildew. And of course, allow airflow. Um, so, you know, even if you're interplanting, you don't want to have things too crammed because you'll lessen the likelihood of disease if you have proper spacing between your plants. And it also makes it easier to harvest. Um, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I've got bean plants. You know, I'm sort of, it's almost like a game of twister <laughs> trying to harvest. Um, but again, if you can, if you can try to um, keep some space between things so that you can get in there. Or if you, if you have a little spot between plants, you could put a stone there or a piece of wood so you could at least put your foot in there so you've got um, some space to, to harvest. And again, that airflow is always, is always good, especially it's been very wet lately. Uh, I've had a lot of rainy weather and having things in close quarters and all that wetness is just a recipe for, for disease. So the more airflow and the easier they can dry when the sun does come out, um, the better. Yeah, so that's sort of in a nutshell, the, the fun stuff you can grow and, and uh, you know, right through until fall if you're, if you're a garlic lover like I am. So if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. I know we did have a few there that I was able to tackle as I, as I was rolling along here. But um, if anyone has questions about succession planting or um, maybe a unique issue you're having with something that you're growing, I'd be happy to, to answer. Again, you can speak up or um, unmute yourself, or you can um, type it in. Ah, hey Janice. Yes, the organic garlic farm. Yes. 
and I forgot the farm word. Yes, that's what they're called. So they're at Highway 89 and 400. Yeah, it's, I mean, they, I think they're, I believe they're a family run operation. They've been doing it for a few years. And again, you can follow them on, on Facebook. Um, one supplier I love, they're in, um, they're just north, uh, northwest of here. They're called Fat Rooster. Um, they've got some beautiful garlic. They're not quite ready uh, for selling at this point. I think they're still harvesting and getting their little, they've got a gorgeous little property if you're up for a drive. Um, now that we're able to travel a little more, um, they've got a lovely little spot and they've got this little garlic shop uh, on their property where you can buy their garlic and they do a wonderful job. I do know they were doing uh, the berry farmer's market. Not sure if they're doing that these days with, with uh, everything that's been happening with the pandemic. Um, last year they weren't there, but uh, you can always check in, uh, look at their, their social media or their website. So how do you know when garlic's ready to harvest? Great question. Um, did, have, did you grow garlic this year? Is, is it something that you're, you're keeping an eye on or are you just, are you just curious? But I can explain that as, as you're uh, answering that question. So typically what you're looking for uh, when you know it's ready, again, you've snipped that scape off. So the scape is that um, sort of center part that comes up and it'll curl around um, and it's got a little bulb on the end. If that were left on there, that would um, become a flower uh, and would have what they call bulbils. So it would create these little um, bulbils on the end. But then that what that would do is create a very small bulb underground if you let that go to the flower, so to speak. So once that little guy snipped off and that's, you know, again, you're waiting for it to curl. That's typically uh, early July um, when that's happening. And right now I'm, I'm harvesting sort of in uh, steps as, as I'm seeing. And so what I'm looking for is about the bottom third of that stalk that's coming up right from the ground. You want to see that browning already because each of those layers, those little sort of leafets that are coming up, each of those dry layers corresponds to the bulb underground. So if you imagine that bulb drying and having that nice um, skin around, around them, that's what you're looking for. If you pull it too early, I mean, there's still a drying process after you've pulled it to, to store it for longer. Of course, you could eat it right away as well, but if you've grown a lot and you'd like to store it, the drier that is underground, the better. So what you're looking for is that, I usually, when I say a third, like at least three of those leaves that are coming up. It's kind of brownish up there. You might even notice the very tips of the top of those uh, stalks are kind of browning. That's when I kind of know. And like I said, I'm doing mine uh, in bits um, because I'm noticing some of them are still quite green at that bottom third and some are, are browning. So I'm pulling them uh, as I go. And again, I'm using a nice um, fork, a nice large fork and nice and far from it. Again, that six inches, you know, goes a long way um, when you're harvesting. And so you're giving that a little loosen. You don't want to just yank it out of the ground. Um, Cause then you, again, you're, you know, that skin is still, is still tender before you're drying it. So you want to loosen it, pull it out, um, lightly brush that dirt that's on there. Do it on a dry day. Uh, don't do it after a thunder shower, like we've had recently. Kind of plan when you're pulling it um, for a little drier days. Not that it has to be bone dry, but it's not a sopping wet day. And then you'll want to lay them out a little bit. And then I'll usually dust some of that soil off uh, uh, before I hang them to dry. And again, if you check out the, the YouTube video, I show you how I hang them and where I hang them uh, to dry them so that I can store them and be eating them at Christmas time and even further into the new year, which is kind of cool. You're, so you're growing bok choy. So Janice says she's growing bok choy and the new shoots are getting cut. Right. So it could be cutworm. <laughs> cutworm uh, is a little worm that likes to come out in the night, in the evening. So of course, not when you're out in your garden uh, to see it. And they like young shoots. So they'll, they were, they were a problem for me earlier in the season when I was growing my beans, for example, my little bean shoots would come up and then I'd come out in the morning and they were knocked over right at the soil line. So that's usually a telltale sign that it's that it's probably uh, a cutworm. And if the plant is still left behind um, and just sort of toppled over, it, it might be cutworm. Um, so one thing you could try to do and something that I was successful with uh, under around your young shoots is if you get, um, I was using styrofoam cups or plastic cups, cut the bottom out and just put that right over um, your plant and kind of have the soil around the bottom so that little cutworm can't make its way to the base of your plant. 
Um, it doesn't really help with slugs. So if you're noticing little nibbles in your leaves, um, slugs, again, they like the night, they like um, wet weather. So you might notice after a rain that the slugs take nibbles out of things. Um, I do find slugs um, aren't as bad a problem if once the plant establishes, but unfortunately the cutworm will destroy your plant. Um, so that's something to try. Uh, you can also, if you don't have cups, you can put uh, sticks on either side or nails on either side of that stem. Because again, they wrap their body around the, that bottom of that plant and they just cut it in half. So if you can prevent them from doing that action, you would probably be ahead. Yeah, so onions, I'm actually growing some shallots this year. Onions, what you're looking for, which is kind of interesting, is you might notice that as they're growing, they're starting to sort of uh, emerge from the soil. What you want to do uh, for harvest is once that neck starts to naturally sort of dip, that's when they're ready to harvest. So if that stalk above the onion is still nice and erect and it's, you know, green and, and uh, you know, heading towards the sky, it's not quite ready. So even though it's coming up from the earth, you want to wait till that um, sort of the green of it just flops over and then you're probably ready. You can always try, pull one out, see how big it is. Um, and again, you, yeah, you do want to dry those as well um, if you're thinking of storing them. So if you've grown a lot of, of onions, you'll want to think about, about uh, uh, storing them for longer and getting that papery covering around them uh, to toughen a little. Um, so someone is asking, our raised garden bed is approximately three by 10 feet. Is there a good guide to calculate the weekly volume of water? You're doing approximately eight to 10 gallons every three days. Hmm. It really depends on, on what you're growing. And, you know, if, if you can get your hands on a, um, a, a soaker hose, so the little drip, drip hoses, and have that set on a timer so that you're not having to, you know, consciously go out and water every day, that's, that's something great uh, to have. And you can just, you know, again, earlier in the day is better as you move into the evening. Uh, and again, you're, you're going to start attracting slugs and and you know the possibility of of just keeping that soil on the base of the plant wet overnight could lead to disease. So again, if you can get that water going, you know before the heat of the afternoon uh, for a couple hours, uh, and it goes right to the base of that plant. So if you can avoid wetting um, the tops with a hose, for example, that's really the best thing again to prevent disease. And some plants require more water than others. You know, your tomato plants will appreciate a good watering. Again, get that, that hose underneath, or if you have a, a watering can with, you know, a direct way to water underneath. Um, and you can kind of tell, you know, the health of your plant, how it's looking, if it's, if it's needing water. If it's very wilty, for example, it's, you know, probably in need of water. Again, we've had so much rain lately that I've hardly had to water. Um, you know, the tomato plants are thriving. They've got a good established root system now, so they're they're going deep into the earth and they're finding that moisture. Um, so you know it really depends on the season as well. So there's not really a, a magic number of how much you should do. Just kind of um, you know see what the weather's doing, see how wet the weather is, uh, get your hands on something automated, makes life a lot easier. And just really look at that health of your plant uh, to see if it's suffering um, from nutrient deficiency or water deficiency. But usually uh, a sagging plant is, is a telltale sign that it's a little water deprived, especially your container plants. Um, you'll want to give them uh, more water. And with your raised bed, again, you're just that much further from the base of you know, the earth. Um, so you, you probably do need to give it water more, uh, more regularly because it dries out quicker. Again, you know, sometimes gardening is, is just very intuitive. Um, you kind of, I'm out there all every day morning, afternoon, evening, just to see what's going on. I mean, with all of this rain, like I said, things have, you know, toppled over. My tomato plants inevitably are always, you know, giant. Um, they're indeterminate, so they like to grow in every direction. Uh, so I'm out there pruning, sometimes sacrificing some of the fruit because I don't want the plant to snap in half, um, which also makes me think I'm going to be better at trellising next year. Um, again, it's always a learning experience and it's always, um, something going on out there. There's always a critter or a evidence that something has happened. Um, or, if, you know, I've got my cucumber plants starting to make their way up the trellis, but sometimes with the weather and the wind, they've knocked down. So I'm out there making sure that you know, I'm training them to, to grow up that trellis. 
So really it is kind of babysitting. Like you're out there looking, you're looking for damage. Um, and again, if you want to be really um, ambitious in the evenings, go out there with a headlamp or a flashlight and look for those slugs and pick them off. Um, if you can find the elusive cutworm, go for it uh, or try to be preventative uh, in the daytime to get rid of those. And something to, to do if you have earwigs, they're, they're another nighttime creature is you've probably heard of rolling up a newspaper or putting out like a, like a paper towel roll out. They like dark crevices, so they'll go in there and then you can dispose of them uh, once, once you capture them, basically, if they're causing uh, trouble on your leafy plants. So circular trellises around our indeterminate tomato plants. Yes, I've done that as well. Uh, so the circular cages, I've got really large ones. They're almost three to four feet, but yet that those plants being indeterminate, um, it's really a vine. So they are, they are just growing to the sky. Uh, again, um, some people will do uh, a row of stakes, which I think I may give a try uh, in the, you know, in the future. Again, it, it is helpful if you have the space for that. You have a nice row that you can, you can put stakes up and it essentially uh, snipping off all those, you know, uh, arms that, that will come up and sort of having that one main uh, stem of your tomato plant uh, attached to that trellis. Especially with, with the weather and uh, unpredictability, I do find I, I do end up losing the tops of a lot of my tomato plants because of that with the, with the circular um, cages. Because, you know, they're, they're going to grow beyond that, those cages, which is, is something that just, just happens. Uh, so someone's asking, any reason why my garlic is always a bit small? I've tried different varieties. So again, this could be that you've um, you've harvested the 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 scape too late, possibly. Um, if you're taking those scapes off, it does transfer that energy back down. Something to think about, as I mentioned, the the bigger the clove, the bigger the bulb. So really, uh, see what you're starting with this fall. Um, you know, how big is your bulb? Um, and again, varieties. Some varieties are bigger than others, but it really it's different factors. So it's the size of the clove, um, how much nutrients you've given that soil. So is it rich in, you know, compost and manure? I find if I grow garlic in the same spot consecutively, season after season, they tend to be smaller. Um, so think of rotating your crops. So plant them somewhere else uh, next year. So switch them up and that might, that might give you uh, better results. But really, again, taking that scape off, big clove that you grow, uh, from the get-go and just making sure that you've got good rich soil and you're waiting for that um, uh, stock to be a third a third of the bottom to be drying out because then you know that you've got your most mature bulb before you pull it and again you're looking around right around now I know some parts a little south of us have been pulling garlic for a couple of weeks now um, but I've tried not to be too eager or too jealous when I see that because I know you know, where we are, I'm, I'm looking at the plant, not at other people's schedules. So it's important to look at your plant and see if it's ready. Yes, get your hands on big bulb. That's why it's important to, if you can find a, a local supplier, like the Cookstown folks or the, the folks up north, uh, that rooster, they will have what they call seed garlic. So it's going to be their biggest bulbs um, with the biggest cloves. And I find varieties that have less cloves. So like uh, four to five or six cloves, they tend to be bigger than the varieties with the sort of smaller, you know, you can get like eight to 12 cloves sometimes. I find those uh, I prefer. So, you know, kind of be picky about what you're, what you're selecting. Um, and sometimes you're looking at, you know, three to $4 a bulb uh, from these places, but it really is well worth it. And you think one bulb will give you at least four bulbs uh, in the end. So um, think about, you know, what your source is. Uh, grocery store garlic, it could be from anywhere. Um, and you're, you know, you're not sure if possibly if it's a hard neck variety, which like I said, does better in our climate. So really that source of your garlic is really gonna pay off. And then once you grow your garlic and you get really good at it and you have beautiful bulbs of your own, you may never have to buy garlic again. Um, you just keep growing from your own garden. So think about that too, when you're growing this season, not only what you're going to eat next year, but what you're gonna to have to sacrifice for seed. So do your math on what you think you might consume for about eight months if you store it properly and what you can sacrifice uh, to grow. Again, check, check with these farms. Um, 
because most of them are family run small, you know, operations and they may not be ready yet. Cause again, we're just sort of starting to harvest uh, uh, where we are anyway. Uh, so get in touch with them and ask if they've got their seed garlic available and how much they're charging for it and what varieties they have or fun varieties they may have. I know last year with the pandemic, I wasn't uh, able to make my way uh, to one of the local farmers. So I used all of my own garlic, which was great. Again, had to sacrifice more than I usually would. Um, but some of them were smaller this year and it's probably because that's what all I had were, you know, some of the smaller cloves. But, uh, you know, this year I think things are opening up a little more and there'll be more available. So get your hands on big, healthy looking, uh, you know, from reputable folks too, like these are folks that, that do this uh, for a living and you know that they're organic and grown well and grown with love probably uh, with these family run operations. So, you know, and you're supporting them, of course, and you're going to get some really good uh, produce. And what I'd suggest too is, you know, buy your seed garlic, especially if it's a variety you've never tried before, and then get some just to eat like that Georgian fire I mentioned. Um, I, I know Fat Rooster uh, carries that and uh, give it a try and, and you can tell the difference you know some are some are hotter uh, some are a little more um you know palatable for uh the average person like like i said music is is a pretty a pretty good standard one oh, how do i try garlic so i do i do have um, a video on that so how to essentially uh dry uh clean them and when i say clean you're never using water you're never introducing moisture to your bulbs um but you're you're essentially getting the dirt off, as much dirt off as you can, anything that could transfer pathogens to your bulb. Um, sometimes you're removing even that first tender layer of, of, uh, of cover on, on that bulb um, just to get that dirt off. You're snipping off the root system. This is, again, after it's, after it's dried and ready to be cured. Um, the way I dry them, um, there's different ways. If you want to get fancy, you can go on YouTube and Google braiding garlic. So you can actually braid your garlic and hang it and that let it dry. So essentially all that energy and all the green parts of the stalk are going into that bulb. If you were to cut um, your garlic right now, you're eating it tonight or over the next couple of weeks because it won't store because it doesn't, it hasn't um, dried those little paper coverings between each clove. So by allowing it to dry and allowing that, all of that green to transfer its energy into that bulb, uh, into those uh, papery layers between the cloves, that's going to give you the longest storage life. And you can have your garlic stored for up to eight months um, and, you know, eating it into the winter. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't do the fancy braiding. I did try it once um, just for the fun of it, but uh, I just essentially have maybe 10 or so together. I kind of stagger the bulbs. Again, in my video, you'll see how I do that. I just tie it with string and then I have a covered porch. So no direct sunlight. You don't want them scorching. Uh, you don't want rain falling on them for sure. And I just have them hanging on a string in, uh, in my uh, covered porch until all of that green is now is brown and dry. So I want that whole stalk to look brown and dry before I go to that next step of cleaning and trimming and cutting off those stalks and storing them. Uh, so it is, it is a process, but again, it's, it's a, really fun sort of almost old fashioned process um, that, uh, you know, is really well worth it. So local seed suppliers, are we talking, are we still talking garlic or just uh, any seeds? Aha. Um, well, you may have attended our Innisfil CD Saturdays, uh, which uh, this year was virtual. Of course, the year prior, unfortunately canceled a couple of weeks prior. Um, but uh, yes, we do love them. Uh, so you know, we do have a lot of local um, seed suppliers that uh, that um, that are there. Uh, if you go to the Facebook page, you can find uh, some links to to the, our past uh, our past folks. Um, some people I really like these days, um, Pollinator Gardens. You may you may know her. Her name's Maria. She's out in just the outskirts of Bradford, and she's got just a beautiful rural property, and she grows everything with love, saves the seeds. She's just an incredible woman um, that's able to create wonderful, um, you know, food and flowers on her property. So Pollinator Gardens, I'd highly recommend her. Uh, I know she sells, she'll be selling seeds in the fall and the spring, of course. And uh, yeah, she grows pretty much everything at so many different fun varieties. So if you're into heirloom tomatoes or, you know, 
lots of different flowers and she just keeps expanding what she grows and it, it's really incredible what she can do. I mean, it's a family farm, but she's sort of the engine behind it. So I'd, I definitely uh, recommend her and she's on social media. Uh, you can find her. And of course, you know, her property is just crawling with every type of um, uh, pollinator you can imagine. She attracts all sorts of things. She raises all sorts of caterpillars, and incredible moths and butterflies. And um, yeah, so just kind of supporting local and, and people that really care about the environment is really cool. If you can find seed suppliers now, I know with the pandemic that seeds are kind of flying off the shelf. People are really interested in gardening, which is wonderful. Um, but it can be tricky sometimes to to order um, the way you used to, perhaps uh, through catalogs and online. Uh, I know some companies were overwhelmed and had to, you know, sort of close shop for a while so they could catch up. So you may not get everything that you want, uh, which is really uh, why I like to say, you know, save your own seeds. Um, <laughs> I can kind of go to my my next little closing here is um, our upcoming uh, workshops. We do have a Q&A between now and then. Uh, we have a, an upcoming Q&A on August 18th, same same day of the week, same time of the evening, uh, where you're able to bring any questions that you have. Um, I usually kind of tell you what I'm dealing with in my garden at that time, and then, you know, it's sort of op open floor for everybody. Then I have my harvesting and seed saving um, webinar, which is wrapping up our Get Out and Grow series on September 22nd. So please do um, sign up for that one. It's, you know, it's free. And I'm here and I'm gardening in your community. So we're all kind of dealing with the same stuff. Um, but if you're, yeah, if you're interested in knowing how to save, you know, your tomato seeds in the best way, or if you, you know, grew a really cool tomato this year, or a friend gave you a tomato that was incredible, you know, save those seeds. And then you're not having to worry about uh, finding seeds next year. You'll have them for yourself. Um, and if you're interested in some free seeds uh, right now for your succession planting, um, the farmers mark the Innisfil Farmers Market tomorrow uh, from one to six at the Rec Center. If you find the um, Innisfil Community Fridge table, uh, Sarah will be there. She's uh, the health associate with the town, and she um, with the Rosardo Center and the town. She'll be there with some seeds that have been provided uh, through the Innisfil Seed Library, uh, which were given to us by Compost uh, Canada, Compost Council of Canada, um, for a, a little project called. Uh, you know, plant, you basically plant a row, give a row kind of idea. So um, there's carrot seeds, beet seeds, again, things you can grow now. And if you're able to grow some and share it with the community fridge, that would be awesome. So those are, uh, if you're interested in some free seeds, I believe she'll be there the following week as well, um, if the seeds are still available. So if you're there anyway, and you're, you know, picking up veggies or baked goods, you know, try to find her table and get some, some free seeds. And of course, the website, uh, mindfulgarden.ca has planting guidelines. So if you're you know, not sure um, how, how deep to plant things, how to space them, how many days to harvest, I've got uh, all sorts of tips and tricks there uh, for you to check out. And of course, email me anytime with questions or pictures. I always love uh, when folks send me things. Someone just sent me her, her potato plant uh, sprouting, you know, the beautiful potato plant she has. Uh, I always love seeing what you guys are up to. So email me anytime with questions or, or, or stuff. Um, just another question here, and then we'll, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, any tips for cucumber beetles? Yeah, so you might be finding those on your um, cucumbers or any of your squash plants. They love any of the gourd family. So your zucchini may, may be seeing that. Um, you know, really the best thing to do is to get ahead of it. If you can, um, when they're young, when the plants are young, um, so this is something to think about for next year. So if, if they're just riddled with, with issues and it's just not something you can save this year, something to plan next year, is to cover them with row covers um, as they're establishing. And once the plant gets a little bigger, a little more robust, you can remove those uh, row covers. Because of course, once the flowers start to form, you'll need pollination to create your fruit. But if you can get those plants a little healthier, more robust before those Cucumber beetles come and make those tiny little plants more vulnerable, you'll, you'll be more ahead of, of saving those plants. And really the best tip is to go around similar to uh, how you deal with Japanese beetles, which you might be seeing. They've, they've been out for a couple of weeks now, shiny sort of iridescent brown beetles. Um, they like to drop when they're disturbed. So if you walk around with a soapy bucket, especially as sort of as the sun's starting to come out, you know, they're waking up, they're, get, they're, they're on your plants, um, they might be in your flowers, on the leaves. Tap 
those leaves with those bugs and they'll their instinct is to usually drop. Sometimes they fly away. If they drop, they'll drop in that soapy water and you know, no longer be an issue for you. You could try hand squishing, but they are fast. Um, I find the Japanese beetles a lot easier to hand squish if you're not squeamish. Um, but if you know if you can if you can tap those in, get them get them off your plant. And again, you're babysitting those plants. If you do have an infestation, you're out there looking at all of those plants um, in that family because they if they're on one, they're probably on another. So you just have to be diligent and, and out there. Yes, you're out there with your soapy cup. So you've got your cup coffee and your <laughs> and your soapy cup. Just make sure you don't mix the two up. Uh, and you'll be good. Again, you're just you're just out there uh, diligent. Uh, insects, again, I, I mentioned this at my last um, webinar uh, about some of the common issues and the common bugs. It really, you know, we're gardening in an ecosystem. And some say if something's not eating your garden, then you're not doing it right. Because then you've probably got pesticides and other nasty things in there that are not healthy for you or the environment. So, you know, just trying to get ahead of things, trying tips and tricks to, again, Get your plant as big and healthy as possible. Um, you might be noticing similar with your kale. You might be noticing the cabbage moths laying eggs and those those green, very camouflaged caterpillars munching away, and they eat very quickly and they'll decimate pretty much your your kale. Uh, again, row covers um, are another another tip, and you can leave those row covers on through the season because. The kale doesn't flower, it doesn't require pollination to grow, and you can have, you know, healthier plants uh, if they're covered. And again, with row cover, if you've got proper row cover, you're getting sunlight and rain going through them, and you're protecting it. Because essentially those, those white cabbage moth, uh, moths are landing on, on it and, and laying eggs, so if you prevent that from happening, you won't have that issue. It probably won't save you from the snails or the uh, slugs, but you know, that's another thing. So again, uh, get out there and, and you know, just kind of be part of the ecosystem that is gardening. What is row cover? Ah, so it is, it's um, sort of a polyester material. You can find it in rolls. I know they've got it at the dollar store. It's a very thin white material specifically for gardening. So you're not using, you know, any old material or bed sheets and that kind of thing. This is a nice, very lightweight, um, typically you'll need some sort of framing for it to drape over so that it's not directly touching your plant. Sometimes you can even find sort of these tunnels, like pre-made tunnels with the fabric attached to it already. And it's kind of an accordion and you just kind of spread it out uh, over the plants you want to protect. But yeah, if you look up um, row cover, you'll see some examples. And the, and the trick too is, is to not just sort of have it over top, you want it right down to the soil line so that you know, those, those, um, you know, even the moths can be creative and come under that cover if they need to, because they, they want to reproduce. That's, you know, they know that those are the plants that they need to lay their egg on because their caterpillars need to eat that source and to, to multiply. So if you can prevent them uh, from doing that, um, it'll save your plants. Again, thanks so much, everyone. You've had so many questions, which has been wonderful. And again, if you have questions um, between now and our Q&A, please, um, at any time, get in touch. Uh, oh, you're very welcome. And I'm glad we'll be seeing you next month. Thank you so much, everyone. And happy gardening. Have fun.